Okay, so I'm going to officially welcome you all. Thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Kara Welke. I am an occupational therapist. I have um, been an OT for 20 um, some years and well, yeah, 20 some years. I guess I can say that now. Um, and I have worked in all different settings, um, ASU and most recently, I started my own um, business where I see older adults in the home through Medicare Part B. So completely different than home health. Um, so I bring the outpatient clinic to my clients. Absolutely love it. Um, I'm also the creator of the Next Level Occupational Therapy um, platform where we have lots of amazing mentors such as Sue and Sheila, who you guys um, saw that was on in the chat section and several other therapists provide lots of great information um, to everyone in the occupational therapy profession and beyond. We have lots of OTs, PT, speech therapists, and other healthcare professionals in our group. So just wanted to um, welcome you guys here and Sue is going to do the majority of the training. Um, she is an expert in this area. Um, she's actually been the um, leader um, in this area and did some presentations at AOTA before AOTA really started sending out some of the stuff that came out in January. Sue um, had done a um, presentation before that. So you guys will learn a lot. Um, and yeah, so tonight, um, Sue will introduce herself. We're going to do the webinar. Um, we are going to be talking about our home safety and modification business builder program. Um, we had finished up with our first round that went very well. We have actually quite a few people and let everyone know um, your thoughts about that. Added and changed and are doing things a little differently. Um, beta group and their recommendations. So we're excited to share that with you as well. So Sue, go ahead. Hi, everyone. So um, I'm an occupational therapist with, oh, 40 years of experience. So yeah, I earned these gray hairs. That's what I'm going to say. Um, so I have just got back from a busy day. So if you see all the stuff behind me, I have seen six clients today um, across the city area. And um, it's been kind of fun. I love doing this. Um, but I was telling Kara earlier that before I left to go out, I spoke to a couple of case managers um, that I had to touch base with. And they have just not saying, not stopped saying, you are the person that really helps us solve our problems. You're the eyes and the hairs. We just are so happy to have you involved and to be working with you. So it's amazing to hear that feedback and super excited. Let me see if I can share my screen and pull up um, tonight's presentation. Let's see if we can get this going. So what I wanna talk to you about tonight is home modifications is not just for seniors. And um, in fact, today, none of my clients would qualify that I saw today as seniors. Um, though I have to admit that all day today, I wasn't doing home modifications entirely, but part of that. So um, the goals for today are to describe situations in which pediatric clients may benefit from home modifications. Also, to, oops, I went one too far. Um, review different areas of specialty for adults and seniors, understand some of the interaction of home safety assessments and modifications with Medicare and other insurance and describe the steps to set up a private practice in this area. So, you know, if we go back and look um, in our OT history, 
for a long time, we've always talked about home modifications. It's always been part of it. You know, I did my education in the 70s in Australia. That's why I talk funny, I am Australian. Um, but as we look at that, you know, we did a big emphasis on home modifications. And in fact, I was one of the lucky ones in terms of we had to draw up the home plans. I learned to draw plans. I learned to read plans in OT school. And that was really helpful when I built my first house a few years later, um, because I actually drew the plans that went through county. And this last time I drew the plans with an architect friend as well, but I drew the first part of the plans with that. So that was part of my OT education there. We've had a long history of practice in this area. And this, the effect of the environment on um, occupational performance has been long written into what we do, but now into the practice framework and the revisions, and it's outlined in most of our state licensure laws. We have a long established proficiency as a profession of identifying the impact of environment and occupational performance, and that's really the goal here with what we're looking at. And so when we look, sorry, when we look at some of the um, pediatric kind of diagnoses that I see and I have been working with for home modifications, you know, we talk about autism and one in 54 children have been identified as being on the spectrum to some form of the estimates. It's across all racial, ethnic and socioeconomic groups and I'm seeing that consistently even in my environment. Four times more common among boys than girls. And interestingly, with clients that I'm treating, I'm treating more boys than girls, but in some ways I've actually been doing more home modifications for the girls that have autism than the boys. It's been a very interesting experience when we look at that. But the environment really impacts um, autism overall. Um, because it can provide opportunity for stimulating experiences, provides calming or cooling down spaces, encourages engagement, social interaction, and skill development, and ensures the safety of the child and other family members. And I, as I'm thinking about this providing opportunity for stimulating experiences, I'm thinking about the client that I just finished seeing. The last client I saw today um, is a young gentleman with autism and his he lives in a supported living environment, so he has 24-hour caregiver um, with him. And we were talking about the fact as he moved into this new living situation, they totally put him in a non-stimulating environment. Blackout curtains, nothing in, in the way of toys or stimulation or anything there save one small box. And um, in that box was all broken toys that he has had for many years. So we're working with them just to think about how that environment is causing some or is, is associated with some of the acting out and some of the behaviors that we're talking to. Very different to some of the home modifications we think about with adults, but still it's part of that environmental experience that we're going to look at with autism. With that, some of the different um, modifications I've done and working on still are things like designing a sensory room. Um, or some of those adaptations. And in fact, with two of the clients I saw today, we're in the process of designing a sensory room um, and looking at getting um, that area there, development of cool and calming areas. So looking at environmental modifications in terms of how do we create that? What kind of colors are we using? What kind of things are happening in that environment? Recommendations for alarms and monitoring systems for wandering, particularly at night. Designing workstations and therapy and work play areas. Recommendations on colors and lighting. Whoops. Uh, recommendations for safety and window protection and wall protection. And this is where I've actually been working more with the girls than with the guys. Um, in terms of the girl, the couple of girls that I've seen, um, there's been a lot of violence associated with some of their behaviors. And so we've been looking at environmental modifications that keep them safe as well as protect the home and protect the other residents in the home. So things like window protection so that they are not able to kick in windows, um, wall protection because they were punching holes in walls, padded wall options so that they didn't get hurt when they were doing this. Um, some of the other things that we're looking at um, 
the last few experiences that we've had around here recently with our severe fires, looking at um, having the facilities or the caregivers prepare for disasters and making sure those are available. Signage, um, identification of spaces and areas, particularly when we're talking about shared living environments, what are options, oops, all right, what are options um, for helping uh, designate their space versus other spaces? Looking at activity schedules as part of the environment and decreasing clutter and organization. And let me just look at the chat here for a second. Uh, let me see if I can put a bit more light on my face. It's gonna get dark outside soon, so. Hopefully that will work. Okay, um, is that better? It's also going to be recorded, so hopefully, but that's not gonna help if we can't put um, that together. Okay, and then um, decreasing clutter and organization. Uh, the other client group that I have been working with quite a bit is with um, a lot of young um, adults and children with cerebral palsy. And of course, you know, it's the most common motor disorder in childhood. Um, we're looking at prevalence around four live births in a thousand. And one in 323 children have been identified with CP according to the Autism and Developmental Disabilities Network. So we're seeing quite a few of those um, clients and we're looking at things for accessibility. This is starting to look a little bit more like some of the modifications that we do with seniors. Accessibility within specific rooms and overall inside the house. So again, not only are we looking at a lot of ramps, um, what I'm finding is that when these children were younger, parents were very able and capable of carrying them and lifting them everywhere. So they were carrying them throughout the house. They were carrying them in and out of the house on the steps. And this is, you know, as the child's getting heavier, we're now talking about 60, 70, 80, 100, even 120 pounds. I'm still finding 67 year old parents carrying their 25, 26, 27 year old children with cerebral palsy um, in and out of the house, in and out of the bathroom, in and out of the bedroom. So looking at um, those kinds of modifications that make those spaces accessible, uh, looking at accessible therapy and play spaces. This was a big one with another one of the ch uh, children that I saw. Suitable height, wheelchair accessible sinks, um, bathing and showering modifications. Looking at lever door handles, grab bars, in fact, one um, young man, we're now looking at automatic door systems, um, transfer systems. So again, looking at what are the best options for developing transfer technology here. Um, frequently, I'm looking at ceiling lift options just because they add so much more flexibility. Um, and then access to lights, you know, being able to turn, operate, all of those kinds of things, um, refrigerator, faucets for age appropriate ADLs, engaging them in those ADLs, encouraging that step. And that's also another part of what I've been doing with um, the young adults and the teenagers um, with autism as well, because that participation in age appropriate ADLs hasn't been um, often addressed. Home automation systems and assistive technology this is getting more common requests now, and a lot of um, the contracts that I have um, with Developmental Disabilities Administration, et cetera, is now an allowance for assistive technology. And so we're looking at how to put some of those systems in play and what does that look like? What are the needs um, and reasons that we would do that? The rationale for creating independence, being able to address emergency situations, all of those things are key. When we look at characterization of developmental disabilities, you can see that autism is part of what they're talking about here as well as cerebral palsy. But we're also looking at ADHD, hearing loss, intellectual disability, learning disability, vision impairment, 
in other developmental delays. And then what I'm often seeing is a combination of both of those. So for example, I had been working with a young man who had cerebral palsy, was in a power chair and then lost his eyesight. So teaching him to be able to still be mobile within his home, setting it up and modifying the environment so that he was able to get cues to know where he was using his power chair, being able to help him develop that confidence again to find things in his home, as well as helping the parents modify the bathroom and get those um, processes in place so that they weren't fully lifting him and that he was able to achieve some independence. And when we look at that, we're talking about one in six children overall meet this category or about 17% of children aged three through 17. So as we look at this, there's still quite a significant population in the younger age group that really need our services. And for general developmental disabilities, um, again, those environmental modifications really depend on the needs and age of the child. But we've been doing some modification of toys and equipment, improving lighting, looking at developing accessible spaces, things like grip-friendly knobs or automation, modified shelving, non-slip flooring, or in some cases, changing the flooring because their method of mobility requires some different kind of flooring surface to allow them to be able to be mobile, um, designing distracted free learning or playing spaces, and even safety modifications to furniture. Um, for example, we had a young man who was prone to seizures, but they had a fireplace within their home, a wood stove within their home, you know, because I'm working in some rural areas as well. So being able to look at putting guards and protectors in place that were safe so that if he was to have a seizure, there's no way he could get burnt on the wood stove that was operating. So those kinds of modifications um, in there are not things that we commonly think about, but are definitely things that we're in within our scope of practice and being able to put together when we look at those natural occupations and participation within the family um, environments with that. So there's a lot of things that we're able to do. In under this whole developmental disabilities area, I would say that 50% of my clientele at least fall within um, that practice area. Whether they're younger, my youngest client I've had has been five. My oldest client with developmental disabilities, amazingly, is actually 75. Um, and so, one of the things that we were looking at with the five-year-old, it was the five-year-old that was actually very destructive. And so that whole area for her with autism was to keep her safe and to keep her family safe, but still provide an environment that she could use as a calming down space, but then there was also a structured space for her as well for learning. When we're looking at my oldest client, um, he lives with a companion in a home. Um, so there's just the two of them and the companion has been taking care of him for a couple of years. But his, um, he has um, cerebral palsy and his um, balance had been getting worse and they had been using a sliding tub transfer bench for him. But now that he, um, was getting older and weaker, his balance was deteriorating. It was getting to the point that the caregiver was holding him up with both hands and he they were both fearful of a fall happening in there. So the client was declining a shower probably five out of seven days of the week. Whereas previously he'd like to take a shower and that was kind of a stress reliever for him. But he was fearful of hurting the caregiver and he was also fearful of being hurt. So uh, the home health OT had been asked to come in and evaluate what was going on. And her response had been, we've got the best we can do. So the case manager called me up for developmental disabilities and said, Sue, I need you to go in here. Any way you can go work with this client and give me some ideas. So we were able to come up with a transferring system, a rolling sliding tub transfer um, system for this client because it's a rental home that they're in. And then we paired that with a lifting system. 
so that we were able to then reduce the whole risk of back injury to the caregiver and the risk of fall to the client. And um, the system's working really well. He's now back to showering every day. He's enjoying it. And they're both feeling safe and comfortable with it. And so that was kind of, you know, this is a rental home. So how do we adjust what we can do in terms of home modifications there? So that's also part of that whole adjustment process to look at how is that working for clients. So when we talk about um, working with um, children with um, developmental disabilities, again, the piece is to take into account not only they're going to be growing and changing, but also what's developmentally appropriate for them and what's going to be developmentally appropriate as they progress and age so that any of the modifications that we make have the flexibility to allow that to occur. And that's why variable play areas, looking at simulating work surfaces, engagement in age appropriate um, ADLs and IADLs um, are all key components of the decision making process when we put this into play. Some of it is very similar when we're doing um, it for adults and some of them are adults when they come through the developmental process right a uh, referral process right now just because they these have not been addressed until it becomes a crisis i'm finding again right now a lot of it's happening we're seeing the caregivers now being 30 30 i mean the caregivers now being 60 65 um and being able to successfully lift someone or at risk in a bathroom or a shower. Um, I had one mom who was totally lifting her son still at 65. He was 120 pounds and she was lifting him into a shower chair in a garden tub. Um, and he, the, it would not stop him from having that extensor spasm and he would slide out and she'd be catching him in the garden tub but the handheld shower to operate in the garden tub was coming from the shower across the room. And so it was kind of a really dangerous situation. So again, all of these systems um, are coming into play when you look at not only the caregiver, the living situation and the needs of the client. They're all things that have to um, be taken into place. Curious to know what your adaptations for the client with seizures and the wood burning stove was. So it took me a little bit of homework, but there are some guards that you can put out a few feet um, from the wood burning stove that has like a gate in it. And then we padded the top of the surface. So first of all, he could not then get within a few feet of it. And even if he fell or had a seizure within that space, he wasn't going to be able to fall over onto the wood stove. And if he fell against the gate or stuff, it was all padded along the top as well. And we were able to make it look like it was um, fairly nice as well in their home. So that was what we did with that. And the family were very happy with that. They allowed them to keep the fireplace, the ambiance that they wanted, the wood stove that they used in that setting, um, but still feel safe. And yet um, other family members who were going to tend the fire were able to get in there fairly easily as well by just opening the gate. We had to leave enough room back, not only that he wasn't going to be able to fall and have a hand or an arm stand, uh, extend through it onto the fire, but the person that was tending the fire had enough room to do the chores that they needed to do behind that as well. Luckily, there was enough, um, it was a large enough room that allowed us to do that with a few modifications to where the furniture and stuff was as well. So I hope that answered the question on that. Um, I just want to go back a little bit now to um, where these referrals come from. And so um, I'm getting referrals from Developmental Disabilities Administration, and I know that name varies from state to state, and um, it's kind of a state function organization, and it um, is one that, um, again, depending on state to state as to what the options are uh, for funding under that, and then from pediatricians, 
um, and starting to get a bit of a reputation, excuse me, with some of those, and then parent groups. I'm finding now I've helped enough clients and um, they, they have these kind of parent groups where they've um, had these kids in classes together or um, have supported each other in other ways. And so now they're saying, oh, I had her come over and do this. And you might benefit from having her come over. And then some of the special education groups have classrooms. So that's kind of where I'm getting those referrals for that from. In terms of the funding sources, um, so for me to do the evaluation and to do some of the research and the equipment, um, Developmental Disabilities Administration really wants me to access the client's health insurance first. So most of that now is I'm, I'm billing Medicare, some of them have Medicare, some of them have Medicaid, and some of them have both. So I am contracted under Medicare and Medicaid, and then I'm also contracted under Developmental Disabilities Administration under three of their programs as well, which is the government waivers and grant options. So that when I see a client, I do a mixed source of funding sometimes, or sometimes not, depending on the waiver systems and what they're on. So learning to know those, learning to know your case managers, learning to know what to ask for. In terms of the complex home modifications, um, those vary. And some of the DME and the things like that, uh, the complex DME, interestingly, I've developed a relationship with um, two of the DME providers locally. And it takes a lot of work to do that. There's only a couple that will work with you usually. And the reason I need to um, do that is some of the stuff is covered under Medicaid that you wouldn't think is covered. So my complex bathing system that I talked about for the older gentleman with cerebral palsy and developmental disabilities, it actually amazingly was a $9,000 system. Ouch, cough. But it was totally covered under Medicaid. I had to write a long letter of justification. I had to work with the DME provider, but we were able to get that totally covered under Medicaid, which is great. The lifting system and um, the, you know, the ceiling lift system we put in, that was about $5,700. We were able to get that covered under a Developmental Disabilities Administration waiver option um, for that client, that specific client. And then some of the ramps and structural changes have specifically been under various forms of Medicaid waiver systems. I have worked with a couple of volunteer um, groups as well. If the clients don't qualify for any of those to look, um, there's a couple of union groups here that will volunteer and a couple of others that we've pulled together um, that have been able to do those systems for me, particularly ramps. That's an easy one to ask them to do. Um, bathroom modifications. Right now, I'm working with two clients on doing two total bathroom remodels. And so those are being covered under a DDA Medicaid waiver um, program that they have. I just thought I'd retouch on some of the trends as well for seniors um, that are making this our prime time to get involved in home mods. Um, it really is an exciting time for that, both in the um, developmental disabilities area, but also with seniors. And one of the things has really come from the changes in Medicaid. There's been a significant shift. It started in 2013, and we're starting to see the results of that now. Um, so even before COVID, we were seeing that um, there's been a decreasing occupancy in nursing homes. And even before the 2013 Medicaid shift in how it was looking at funding, there was that um, because it's been happening for a, a couple of decades. There's been a couple of things related to that, that people are wanting to stay at home. And the number of patients discharged from hospital to nursing home for rehab has also declined significantly. And this was a new article just out in the um, New England Journal of um, Medicine um, that was looking at this data. And most of it has come from um, 
data related to reducing healthcare costs and looking at trends that reduce that. And some of it has come from the research from John Hopkins, um, from the Capable Program, and some other kind of Medicaid waiver and transformation programs. So one of the things, of course, now is that there are more demands on families who are now being responsible for providing informal and unpaid care. In, um, it was interesting, the data, they said an adult who cares for an aging parent will face losses equivalent to 100000 a year on average, roughly the same cost as a nursing home stay. So they've moved the shift of the cost directly more to the family. But I think what's interesting is those families often don't have the awareness of, of what we can offer or the resources or access to them to be able to look at putting some of those systems in place. Um, and this is, I find a lot when I'm talking to clients in some of my referrals for home modifications um, in the senior population have come because I've got a referral to do a wheelchair evaluation and the, do and the docs have known to send that and the wheelchair company has, you know, contacted me to come and do that. But when I get there, I find they're in need of lifting systems. They don't have other supports in place. They need bathroom modifications. And this is a client that would qualify for a Medicaid waiver, but they've never actually been um, even aware that that's an option. And I'm thinking of two clients right now, particularly in one African-American lady, sweet as can be, 92-year-old, hip totally degenerated, not able to stand on it, is having lots of, have had been having lots of problems getting in and out of bed. Doc knew she needed a chair, wasn't aware of anything else related to her needs, but getting in and out of bed, getting in and out of the shower, getting in and out of the toilet, getting in and out of a recliner are all of the issues that we're facing. Again, in a rental apartment, but we were still able to put some modifications in place using the Fair Housing Act, which, you know, we talk about in our course and what those are, and being able to get things in place for her and then using some of the Medicaid waiver dollars to be able to look at doing that. Of course, the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID disease, 19 disease, and are now leaving hospital systems earlier. I know they've extended some of the changes for them getting home health, but I'm still seeing reluctance on home health to deal with some of these issues. And I'm also finding that they're having a two or three year, a two or three week wait for home health to get in there. So I'm now finding I'm getting case managers calling me and saying, I need you to go in there right now to tell me what this client needs so that they're safe immediately because I'm not able to get home health in there for another three weeks. Can you come and help me out? So I'm getting a lot of those referrals. Um, we're also getting a lot of clients that are leaving skilled nursing or assisted, learning, uh, assisted living facilities or adult family homes if they can. In with a lot of this, you know, because family members weren't able to see them, I have had a, a family, there's only just started some visiting right now, the wife has dementia, you know, and it closed down here much. And so April and May, we're still having wet weather. The husband is going and standing outside her door, her window. He can't go inside, outside her window in the pouring rain, just trying to say hello versus he was able to see her every day. And she can't understand why he's outside the window and why he's there. So this is a family that have now decided they want to bring her home and what are the options and how can they do that? So in this environment, um, Medicaid has actually put um, more funding in place to look at that. And the government has moved some funding that way versus people going into the hospital. And it is um, being managed by Area Agency on Aging and DSHS case managers. Again, I have contracts with those, so they call me to look at what can you do to support and make sure this is successful. Um, one of the other things that we don't talk about very much in terms of impacting that is chronic diseases and chronic conditions. And we're seeing an increase of those, um, but six in 10 adults, and these are not technically all seniors, but um, it's more, you see a lot more of the effects of their seniors. Um, 
but six in 10 adults have a chronic disease and four in 10 adults have two or more conditions. So, and most of the conditions they measured were arthritis, asthma, cancer, cardiovascular disease, uh, COPD, and diabetes. And so when we look at that, they're the leading causes of death and disability, but they're also the leading drivers of our healthcare costs. And so one of the things we're looking at is what does that do? Well, there's a lot of information. You can see this comes from the National Council on Aging and their Stop Falls lecture, but the presence of these chronic illnesses increases the fall risks considerably and it also limits their reserves and increases their fragility. So we're seeing again um, that these are drivers of increased fall risk um, for these clients in potentially related to lower extremity weakness, but in fact, some of the research we have now says upper extremity weakness is related to it, um, deconditioning, poor endurance, um, and slower reaction time. And in fact, the research is really strong that both direct and indirect um, the most chronic conditions increase the risk of falls. It's estimated that chronic conditions account for 30% of all the falls that we see, um, and those have indirect effects such as a reduced physical activity, muscle weakness, and um, poor balance, all things that we can um, address as therapists, but also address um, reducing falls. This data made me really sad when you think about this. John Hopkins did a study, and we'll talk about why this is important in a minute, and found that 42% of older adults with probable dementia had difficulty performing daily activities, but did not get assistance from family, friends, or paid caregivers. It's an eye-opening um, condition uh, figure because one of, one of the seniors with at least three conditions and high needs 25% of that population didn't get any assistance at all. Um, so that is kind of a concern. Um, nearly 60% of seniors with seriously compromised mobility reported staying inside their homes and apartments instead of getting out of the house. And a quarter of that population said they didn't even get out of bed, right? And of the older adults who had difficulty putting on a shirt or pants, 20% went without getting dressed. That's one in five of them. And of those who required assistance with toileting issues, over a quarter of them had an accident or soiled themselves. So in response to this, um, President Trump um, signed the Chronic Care Act into place um, and it went into effect in um, 2019. And what it does is allow Medicare Advantage plans to offer some changes in what they offer. And one of the things that they're allowed to address is in-home safety modifications, such as bathroom um, grab bars, et cetera. Ramps was also mentioned in some other places. It's going to allow the Medicare Advantage plans to offer different um, benefits to different groups and also allows them to address things in an innovative way to try and deal with chronic conditions and reduce the spending, but also um, being able to address more the root cause of what's happening versus waiting until the symptoms develop. And so this is an interesting new thing that's coming out now, but also a role for let's not let the nurses take over deciding what happens here. We need to be really proactive as OTs. The new rule will allow those plans though to be really different. So it's gonna be variable in whichever place. But remember Medicare Advantage takes over original Medicare, right? So this is not clients who are on original Medicare. These are Medicare Advantage plans. Medicare itself has also realized that falls are a big deal and they're providing incentives for um, therapists, but doctors, chiropractors, podiatrists to address falls. And so one of the things with this is they're actually giving an incentive by increasing their reimbursement if they meet these quality measures. And one of those quality measures, 154 and 155, address falls risk. 
And so if the medical providers annually ask their patients over 65, have you fallen in the last year? And did any of those falls result in an injury? So if they've had two or more falls or one injury fall, then the provider needs to implement a plan of care that addresses that. And when you look at the plan of care, the plan of care recommendations that they have are reviewing medications, asking if they've had an eye exam in the last year and then referring them for one if they haven't, reviewing any other medical conditions that may have contributed to the um, situation, determining the president presence of postural hypotension, so make sure they're monitoring their blood pressure meds really well, and then they should be provided with a plan of care that includes balance, strength and gait training instructions, advice on vitamin D, and information about occupational therapy and fall hazards. And there is that is written specifically into the plan. And so again, you know, we need to be available to be able to do that. And if you look at the CDC recommendations, this is an older version in the study, but it's in all of them. These are provided to the doctors and what you can do. And right here it says, refer to OT to assess safety and patient's ability to function in the home. Of course, I put my little logo in there, well, this is my older version, and said, this is how I can help you meet these requirements because these are the programs that I offer. So um, that's it there. So based on that, of course, this is the covered service, right? Um, so for our Medicare clients, and this includes um, any of our younger clients that are on Medicare, and I can see I'm in the dark here, and I've never had that happen before. Hmm. Um, one of the other things to think about is that OT is a covered services, service. These are medically um, necessary, and we are able to bill for those services under Medicare. In fact, we must bill for those services because we are not eligible to opt out of Medicare. So if clients have Medicare and these services are medically necessary, we need to bill Medicare for them. And of course, we just saw that Medicare actually wants us to. They're saying this is a covered service. And there are penalties if you don't. In fact, there's a $2,000 fine for each violation, 10% reduction in payment if you get back in compliance, and you can be actually excluded for limited time or permanently from ever being part of a system, Medicare or Medicaid. And the other key piece of this though, is that there's a whole reduced customer base. For me, I have a small percentage of clients that are private pay and have the ability to pay privately. Most of my clients are Medicare and Medicaid. Oh, that makes a bit more of a difference. Um, Medicare and Medicaid, and they really, you know, can't afford the private pay options. And so that is, um, again, you know, looking at the clients that you're serving and what those options are. Kara, do you want to talk about how people can get started in this process? I sure can. And we have a question, Sue. Um, <clears throat> so Carrie, yes, Carrie asked, when you get re oops, my video's off, sorry. Carrie asked, um, when you get referrals to assess homes before clients are discharged home, how do you bill? Um, so those would not meet Medicare criteria. So usually the case managers set it up that I'm right there as they come home um, for me to build the insurance. I have had a couple of occasions where clients actually want me to do this prior to them being discharged and they will private pay under those circumstances. So I need to do an ABN um, because it doesn't qualify, I mean, because it doesn't meet the qualifications, the client's not there. They're also billing part A at that time for either inpatient skilled nursing or inpatient hospital. So yes, hopefully that answers, Carrie. And if you have other questions, um, let us know. So, um, so how do you get started? Is there anyone on live that wants to start your own business focusing on home mods? Or 
just is there anyone on live that wants to start their own business working with older adults um just kind of as a whole but also do home mods um let me know um kind of where you guys are at or maybe some of you have already started your own business share for us where you guys are at um with this so so i see people saying yes um when i finish my otd both okay and several awesome. raised hands okay sounds good um so how do you get started? Um, so this is just gonna be a real brief overview. Um, we do have resources for you guys um, to download on our website that we'll direct you to that you can print off and have you know, for you um, as well. But we wanna kind of go over just the basics here. So how do you get started? Um, first of all, you need to um, decide on your market focus and your goals. Um, it's not as OTs, um, we think sometimes that we can do everything, right? Um, when I always tell people we can do everything. Um, and my husband jokes that we think we can do everything, even surgery. And I'm like, well, whatever, but we can. Um, no, but when you're starting your own business, it's best to focus down and have a niche area or, or primary client area. Now, I will tell you with my business and well as Sue, um, you know, she sees more than just strictly home mods, um, but she does do a ton of home mods. For me, um, my pr primary population is just older adults that want to stay at home, age in place, um, you know, and can't get to an outpatient clinic, things like that. So we do a, a variety of things in my business. But there is such a huge need for home mods, um, that you could totally do a business just focused on that. In fact, I, um, with my business, I do do quite a few home mods. We work with a VA system and there's actually an OT that he's no longer functioning as an OT, but he's working for this company and they just go out and do all this home mod stuff. Like they're the ones that go out and put in the grab bars. They're the ones that go out and do everything. And it's kind of funny because one of my clients, it created all this confusion because the client's like, well, we already had an OT there. And well, he wasn't the OT that did the eval. He was, you know, giving them some ideas for ramps and grab bars and so forth. Um, but he covers, like he lives two to three hours away from me. I mean, someone around here needs to be doing that more. I don't have time to just focus solely on that, but it's such a huge need. So decide on your market focus and goals. Um, then you need to get your business established within your state. Um, and yeah, depending on some of your cities require different things and so forth, but getting your business established within your state when you do this you need to know what your states require this is so important because we've seen quite a few people have um, some problems come up recently where they maybe have done an llc and they were supposed to have done a pllc or maybe they did an s corp and they only needed an llc um, so different states have different rules so you need to know what kind of business you need to establish for your state um, once you have your business established, then you need to get your EIN um, or tax identification number, sometimes you hear, but EIN in the, this business world and a bank account for your business. You obtain an MPI type two for your business and enroll, as a, enroll with Medicare as a provider. Now, if you are only doing pediatrics, Sue, I mean, there would be no need for Medicare, right? Uh, so, um, depending, depending again on if you're going to do developmental disabilities and take older clients with developmental disabilities, um, I would say 50% of my referrals from Developmental Disabilities Administration are Medicare clients. Right. So yeah, that's just it. I mean, 
Medicare clients aren't necessarily just 65 and above, so you need to be aware of that. But, but if you're going to do this and work with older adults, you really do need to become a Medicare provider. Not saying that all of the all of the services and times you see older adults are going to be billed Medicare, but there are going to be those cases. Um, once you get established with Medicare, um, then there's a whole process of getting your EMR connected to um, the clearinghouse and then connected to um, Medicare so you can go ahead and get billed or so you can bill and get paid. Um, you need to have a policies and procedures manual. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't know why I need that. Medicare actually requires a Medicare compliance policy. So you do need to have these things in place um, in order to one, just know, you know, what's the difference between rehabilitative maintenance therapy services? How do you handle clients? What are your intake procedures? How do you do all of that? Um, you need to establish a marketing plan, decide on your record keeping strategies, um, both medical records and financial records, decide on how you're going to do your billing, um, and then of course get ready to serve the clients who need us most and have fun. Um, Another thing just I was going to pop in, Sue, just um, <clears throat> yesterday I was with a client who the caregiver um, is just overwhelmed. Her husband has dementia um, and bathing and toileting are just a nightmare. So we're working on um, a bathroom remodel. And once you start digging, there are some great programs out there, great grants, um, great financing options in the different states. Um, we ended up finding a variety of different things that would, um, that she could apply for and or just complete a simple application to help her with the funding for those home modifications. So there's so many things out there that a lot of people have no idea. And like the client said, or caregiver said, she's like, I would have no idea. You know, how do people even know about this? But as OTs, we really need to dig into all of that and know all of those resources that are available in the community. Um, so yes, this is um, the free checklist and we can email this out to you, but it goes into more detail and you can utilize that um, to help you with starting your business. Um, we also have um, just, a, I think, two spots left as of earlier today um, in our therapy business builder cohort four program. So we're at almost 50 therapists now across the United States where we have helped start and build their business from the bottom up. So if you haven't done anything, you want to start your own business, um, definitely reach out um, and we can provide even more detail about the Therapy Business Builder Program, but we help you guys um, start and build your business. And this all came because of myself who started, made tons of mistakes, ended up costing me more um, time and money than if I would have had the help and resources I need to do it. So that program is an option if you guys um, are wanting to start and build your business. But we want to um, introduce tonight our, um, this would be basically round two of our home modifications practice. Um, Sue obviously is, is the lead trainer in this course. Um, but we did our beta group um, May through about August um, and that went well. And then we took time to adjust um, some trainings and we've decided to add some new trainings um, to even um, provide more um, for you guys that are wanting to do the home safety and modification business, um, utilizing a hybrid approach. So again, we're huge believers in the hybrid approach that not everything's med B, not everything's private pay, um, you know, there's workman's comp, there's private insurances, there's tons of different things out there. So it's knowing and understanding what works best for you and your business. Um, so in the trainings, 
we have a variety of trainings that um, kind of include the process and setting up your business. And we go into detail as far as what do you need, um, cash versus insurance, what really is a hybrid practice, detailed training on Medicare Part B and home mods. Um, we are bringing in some different therapists that um, have gone through the different home modification certification programs um, to do some trainings and question and answer sessions because we hear this all the time. We hear people, what is the CAPS? What is the um, ECHM? What is the CLIPS? What one do I need and so forth? So um, we're gonna be putting together a panel for you guys. Um, with people that have gone through the different programs, plus we're hoping to bring in some trainers um, from those programs. Um, we've added a training on legislation that impacts home modification, looking at universal design, ADA, and the Fair Housing Act. Um, and then we're gonna actually talk about how to create the optimal hybrid approach. And um, we provide the policies and procedures for you for your home mod business. Um, and it also has forms and templates that you can use. Then we go into marketing your business, um, how to market and build your business, um, how to build a Facebook group for your business, how to work with your area agency on aging, which is huge. I can't believe like, I mean, I've been a therapist for 20 some years and I, I, um, my undergrad degree was social work and for my social work degree, I actually did my internship at Area Agency on Aging. Um, and so I, I kind of knew what they did, but it wasn't really until during COVID that I've really developed a huge relationship with them and have, I mean, it's, they have some great services for my clients and are able to refer back and forth. Um, we are having, um, new trainings on designing your website and we have um, templates specifically designed for home mods um, and area aging and adult aging services are those the same sue i might have put that in there twice um yes i think you might have put that in there twice so that's only once okay um then how to run your hybrid practice um how to deal with medicare part b private pay, workman's comp, Medicaid, commercial insurances, and other funding sources. So we provide in-depth Medicare and credentialing training, um, and we partner with Anthony Maritato for that. We um, have a training on completing the home modifications process under MedB and other payers. We talk about how to establish your systems because you need a good system in place when you're doing this, um, what tools you need, how to read a floor plan. Um, we have a, um, architecture, design, um, construction person that's coming in to do that. Then we go through before your first visit, what do you need? Your first visit, how should that look? What do you need after your first visit? And there's checklists that go through all of that different things. Then we'll talk a little bit about telehealth and home modifications. However, um, just, I don't know if anyone knows this or not, but um, we had a Medicare training tonight and um, as of now, telehealth and Medicare is going away for therapy um, at the end of this year. So that's a, that's a blow. Um, okay. I think we covered all those. Um, and then documentation and billing for home modifications. So, what assessments to utilize in your practice, um, EMR and billing for home mods, documentation for home mods. Um, we have partnered with Home for Life Design, um, Carolyn, um, and she's an OT developer, a software application tool. And for those in our program, they get a discount to utilize the assessment. Um, with that, but they also are providing additional training for those in the program. And we also have a training and special um, deal for utilizing Magic Plan, um, which is another tool you could utilize in your home um, design work. And Sue has custom designed forms and reports that, um, that you can get access to if you decide to go the Magic Plan route. 
Um, we go over payment and funding for home modifications, um, getting paid in your cash-based practice, um, and um, funding for home modifications on top of what we already talked about with Medicare Part B and the insurance and so forth. So, and the new thing um, we have added is introduction to specific population approaches for home modification. And, um, you know, we had a great um, beta group and they had, um, they had different, um, ideas and suggestions and some of these were coming from them. Um, so we have added um, low vision, dementia, developmental disabilities, workman's comp, what if it's a rental home, what can I do, safety and emergency planning for clients with disabilities. All of these specifically focused um, for home modifications. So, so I'm excited for those new trainings because they're definitely needed just for myself even with um, the different clients with dementia I've had, it's, they need home mods huge. So, um, additional benefits of the program, you get one year of monthly group coaching calls. Um, with Sue, um, you are automatically a member of our Next Level Visionary Membership Group and you get um, the Next Level Occupational Therapy Summit, which has 27 plus trainings in it. And then membership for one year to a private Facebook group. Um, you also get 20% off of Hello Note and a custom designed Trello board to help keep you organized and successful with your journey. So this goes through um, the total value of the program is over 28,000. Um, the total price of the program is $3,798. We do have some additional add-ons um, that are just for those in this home modification program. Um, so we have um, a deal to help you get credentialed and EMR, things like that. Um, we have someone that can help with establishing your business. We have some specials with um, Magic Plan um, that can do, um, we have someone that will custom design your website specifically for home mods. Um, and since um, dementia and, well, Alzheimer's disease and dementia, a lot of those clients need home mods. Um, it's great to become a certified um, dementia practitioner. Um, so we have a special price for that for you guys as well. Um, those of you that are on the webinar and um, sign up. So this program starts October um, 14th when we're launching round two. And those that sign up prior to um, Friday night, um, the ninth, we'll get an additional $200 off um, as well. And we do limit the amount of people um, in this program to 20 people at a time, um, just because if it gets over than that, then that's a little too much. So, um, so yes, if anyone has any questions on the program, we can are more than happy um, to address your questions. If you don't have a business at all whatsoever and you want to get started, we have a special deal for those wanting to do our therapy business builder program and home mods course. So there's a variety of things we can do to help you guys. And we recommend jumping on a phone call with us so we can make sure the programs are right for you because um, there's a lot of different things out there. Carolyn, um, when you are ready to start using um, the magic plan documents, just let us know and um, we can help get you going on the magic plan documents. Um, so the, how often do you have the therapy business builder program for home mods? So our home modification program, um, we haven't determined when our next um, launch or when we'll have it again. Um, we had our last in May, May, June, July, August, September. So it'd be probably at least five, six more months um, before we have another one. Um, Randy, yes, um, the Medicare coverage for telehealth is 
is not going to be any longer after um, after the first of the year, according to a Medicare training I attended um, tonight. We have we have webinars on a regular basis in our next level group, um, and tonight we had a Medicare compliance officer come in and um, some other specialists in Medicare. And <clears throat> during COVID, they ended up approving telehealth. Um, or Medicare coverage for telehealth, um, but they had said it was, you know, just temporary. But um, as of now, it sounds like that's going away um, at the end of the year. Great questions. Any other questions that you guys have? For private pay, um, for telehealth, yeah, um, if, if Medicare doesn't cover it, um, then they would have to private pay. But I'll just tell you from experience, um, well, I mean, it obviously depends on where you live, but um, every single one of my clients that has Medicare greatly appreciates that we bill Medicare because um, they don't want to pay privately for that. Um, on top of that, they are not big fans of telehealth. Um, they much rather have us there in person um, when we're working with them. So I don't know what will happen. It'll be interesting. Great questions. What other questions do you guys have? Do you have any more questions about like working with the developmental dis disabilities population or with the seniors population? Feel free to go ahead and ask those. And we did have someone, Cindy, I think you mentioned um, you're currently working home health. Um, we have a lot of home health therapists that are starting their own Medicare Part B business. Um, you know, it's a great, it's a great transition over to having your own practice. Um, and you obviously are well aware of working with clients in the home. We also have therapists that are starting with a mobile practice and that hope to move into um, a um, clinic someday. So, I mean, it's a, good, it's a good way to get started and transition your services if you wanna do something different. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's a great um, point or place to start. Um, how long do you recommend getting home health experience before starting your own practice? Um, we have therapists that are right off the ground and start their own practice. Um, so, you know. I, I didn't technically have any home health, real home health experience in terms of home health, but I've been in OT for a really long time. And back when I started, we always took our clients to the home before discharge. So had a lot of experience doing that. Um, but not, no actual home health experience. Yeah, and don't let being young or um, just out of school stop you from starting a private practice, especially now there's so many resources out there to help support you. Um, and I know you um, for sure, Kelsey, that um, you know, you definitely are proactive on what kind of services should be provided. And unfortunately, they're not being provided in a lot of different settings. So it's a great way for you to practice, you know, client-centered, occupation-based, evidence-based um, treatment um, for sure. So, um, so the OT that I was telling you about doesn't function as an OT whatsoever. I mean, he totally functions as a installer, you know, as a builder. Um, but it was confusing to my clients, I know, because he, he mentioned that. Um, the Our home modification um, program is starting Wednesday, October 14th, um, and that will be our first um, training that night um, orientation to the program. Um, what would be your biggest piece of advice for a student looking to go into this practice area? Um, getting help and support, um, doing it on your own is, is silly um, because there's so many great resources out there. And if you do any research at all on how to develop a business, you know, it, 
they talk about having a network of support, um, investing in yourself and making sure that you get everything set up right from the start. Um, you know, a lot of us um, that tried to do it on our own made many costly errors that, um, and yeah, we would have been way better off, you know, having someone to help us, but there wasn't anything. Um, there's just now is finally some things that are there to help people. Well, and, and we also made errors that, that could have cost us, but also um, stopped us billing and earning as much as we could have or engaging with our clients as well as we could have done. So it slowed us down. So, um, and put us at risk as well. I mean, there were things that we did that we've learned now. It's like, oh, probably that was not <laughs> the best idea. I'm not gonna name them in public, but, um, you know, and I think one of the things when I started in Cara had the same thing, was thinking that we could just go out there and do this and not bill Medicare. And I thought it was just gonna be cash pay and I was gonna do that. And uh, I was talking to the chiropractor who had an office next to me and she's like, uh, we can't opt out. You need to go and read the rules. And that's when I was like, oh, if I had known that in the first place, then I would have had all that in place. And then all of a sudden I had committed to seeing all these patients and I couldn't. Um, and so then I had to you know, put everything on hold. So that was an interesting piece. And then Carrie, um, that kind of goes back into your question about that doesn't practice as an OT. We have to be really careful with that because since we credentialed and trained as an OT, if we mention that we're an OT to a client and we're not working as an OT, here is kind of a connotation or some pieces that we put ourselves up for legally and liability wise. So we have to be very careful as well. And if we actually assess the client in any way to look at their functional performance and look at what they're doing in terms of functional for performance and impact on the environment, then we're still looking at practicing within our practice law. So we have to be really careful in terms of acting as a consultant if we're not saying we're an OT and what we're actually doing. So just to be a bit wary of that. Um, it's very hard for us when we're OTs too to take off our OT hat. Mm -hmm. um, and so I find if I'm looking at home mods, I'm always going to do a functional assessment of the client to match those two together. And it really is my OT hat that's doing that. Otherwise, if I'm not doing that, then they may as well have a CAPS trained builder who's going to use um, universal design or ADA, which isn't going to fit this client uniquely. The unique role of OT in this level is being able to do that. And that's where a technician can't do it. That's where a contractor can't do it. And when we look at the research studies now, and we look at the bulk of the research in this area, there is research comparing a trained technician to an occupational therapist doing home mods. And the difference is remarkable. It is in favor of an OT. There's something about us as OTs that is unique about how we view a client, view occupational performance and the impact of the environment with them. And so it's very difficult to have that same impact without that. Yes, so true. The other thing, um, let's see, Laura asked, what's your biggest piece of advice? Do not believe everything you read on Facebook. Um, every day I see something that's put out there that is wrong. Um, always ask for the source of information. Make sure people are citing where they're getting that information from. Um, you know, I mean, there's people doing this stuff that are, yeah, just, I mean, that's what kind of got me going down my wrong track when I first started, because I was asking on Facebook and, um, yeah, I got a lot of wrong information. Um, so you need to go to the experts um, to ask your questions and make sure you know what you're doing. Um, as far as um, Jessica, for those of us who are trying to transition to our own practice but still working for a larger company, how do we stay away from the conflict of interest issue? I'm a bit concerned about this because of how strict this seems to be. Any insights on this would be greatly appreciated. Um, well, and it really depends on what kind of company you're working for. What actually are you doing? Are you a competition for them? 
what, you know, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, we've had quite a few therapists in our therapy business builder program that um, continue to work and their, their places of work knows what they're doing, but what they're building their business for isn't what they're doing in practice. So they're able to do that side gig. Um, we've had some therapists that, um, you know, have had to leave their job because it was a conflict of interest. Um, you know, it really depends on the situation and where you're at. So like for me, I was kind of lucky because one, I was teaching full time. Um, okay. Then I was also working in a transitional care unit, but for the hospital, um, the really only hospital in our area. And I just knew that I needed to leave that job, um, even though they weren't doing the services that I was in the community. Um, I just knew I needed to leave that because I didn't want to deal with any sort of conflict. Um, and I had my other job, so that worked out kind of easy, but it depends on where you're at. So, um, Eric, we will um, send out the recording of this webinar to everyone that was registered for it. So you'll get the recording of it. Yeah, so in terms of job, I was in a similar situation to Kara. I was, um, working full time as an academic and doing PRN in skilled nursing facility. So I left teaching because I didn't want to be doing the three hour commute. Um, and so basically I just upped my PRN in the skilled nursing facility until I was able to pick up my caseload and um, then drop that back down. Um, and then eliminated it because I'm working way too busy right now. So so interestingly asking, uh, is it interesting doing field work in home mods? So if you can get someone to do something, I would recommend taking on like a mobile part B or something along those lines. I just had a student um, July, June, July. Um, Cara has two students right now, one virtually and one in person. And hats off to you that they're two that you have at once. Um, but it does mean we don't get to chat as much as we used to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that. Um, but definitely there are ways to look at can you do field work in it. Um, one of the things I would think that I wouldn't recommend this is your first field work. Um, for example, for my student, one of the things I did recommend for when she went to look at a job is to be aware because of what happened um, with her, co I mean, part of the issues were related to COVID as well, didn't get the experience. But, you know, I don't um, do a lot of heavy transfers. I'm not constantly doing those. So I'm not training the student to do transfers and difficult transfers. So again, making sure, you know, that you're not going to necessarily get that because I'm working with caregivers and the client in the community. So I'm rarely doing it. I do do training related to it. So there's some things that you're going to miss out on some of those basic um, skill sets in like physical disabilities and rehab. Um, but definitely there's a lot of other things you're going to get and see in, you know, if you were to do something with like Cara or myself or someone in that situation, your field work would also be related to the business. And, you know, that's part of what my student got, what it took to run a business, how you get referrals, how you respond back to those referral sources, how you do some of the education pieces, um, some of those things. Yeah, reach out um, to different therapists. So yeah, I have an occupational therapy assistant student that's here with me um, and I have an um, occupational therapy student that's virtual. So um, it's it's been a lot of fun um, and I mean, but yet it's hard, but that was one of my things. They had to have had another field work because it's definitely, well, I think it's what, what I do is actually what OT is really supposed to be, but it's definitely not like, you know, what you would get like in a hospital or skilled nursing facility. So, so Eric, it really depends on what you mean by partnering. Um, and, and there's a couple of issues related to that. 
Um, there's the ethics issue of what you're recommending and being very clear to your client that where you're getting a cut or money out of this. And so for that reason, I actually don't get any cut or money out of the pieces because I want a very clear um, thing with the clients that I'm recommending something for their advantage, not because I'm getting paid about it. But also you have to think about um, how that partnership evolves because often what happens with the builders and have been through this process, if they see you as a cost, they're not likely to be working with you. So one of the things, there's a couple of therapists that do this that actually have their general contractor license, but they do it in a different manner and they're the contractor doing that piece. But again, if you're, again, I'd say, if, you know, the ethics piece of if you're recommending it to the client, you need to give them other options and be very clear about what you're um, making out of that according to AOTA ethics guidelines. So there's, there's a mixed piece of that. There are OTs that own contracting companies, just like we talked about with that gentleman that um, Cara was, but they're not necessarily doing the OT piece of it anymore either. Um, so it's kind of mixed with that. Sorry, I forgot I muted myself. My dog keeps running in here. Great questions. Um, any other questions that anyone has. Um, if you guys didn't watch um, the five reasons why you should start a practice working with older adults now, um, you should definitely watch that webinar because, you know, this is such a great time for us to be starting these types of businesses because there is an absolute huge need out there for it more than ever um, as awful as covid and everything is it has created more work for us in this area because i mean i have clients all the time um, that have come home um, from assisted living facilities. They're moving home from nursing homes. They're avoiding going into nursing homes. They're doing everything they can to keep their loved ones at home. And in order to do this, there, there needs to be modifications and so forth made. Um, and again, we fit the bill to be able to do this, so. Yes, I get lots of referrals from MDs. And in, in Medicare land, you have to work with the MD. There, there's requirements from Medicare about how you do that. So definitely. Have good partnerships with multiple um, MD offices now in the area. <sighs> How big an area do you serve? Currently, I have contracts in two counties and I have driven into a third. So I actually have um, gone for DDA two and a half hours one way. I don't do that regularly because <laughs> there's not a lot of payment for um, driving time. Um, but sometimes I do it as a favor for a case manager with a complex client um, that I'm going to be spending a lot of time with. But generally, I cover two counties, um, and that's what I have the contracts with, with Area Agency on Aging and um, Medicare with the state. I stay within probably a 30 mile, mile radius. I mean, I've driven more than that, um, but I try to stay within a 30 mile radius usually, so. What's the frequency you see for home mods? So here's the issue. Usually I find when I see a client for home mods, I find a bunch of other issues that need to be addressed. So I'm actually addressing those as well. Usually I find they need a new wheelchair or they need a wheelchair. They need different other kinds of things. So I may do six to eight visits, um, depending on the process. And again, you know, looking at that, you have to put your plan of care in carefully to Medicare and look at the reviews and some of it thinking about with home modifications, um, how long those are going to take. 
So again, thinking about how you develop your plan of care and how it's going to be tapered in the frequency. So those are all things we talk about when we look at the trainings for the process so that you meet those requirements for um, Medicare on developing your plan of care and having the physician sign off on that. But again, it really depends when I go in for the eval what I find. Um, the, one of the evals that I have done recently, um, the client had not been out of bed in four years. <laughs> and so, you know, I've actually been working with her on building up sitting tolerance, on getting her a wheelchair. We had a lifting system in place, caregiver training. Um, and then um, looking at um, getting her into sitting and tolerating sitting. And I have now had her where she's doing 50 um, minutes up in the chair. Uh, do you have contracts with the counties? Do you appeal the patient or the county agency? Again, it just depends. <laughs> it goes back to um the situation generally speaking i have very few private pay clients most of my clients are covered under medicare medicaid or private insurances and if not they're covered under waivers from area agency on aging or um from the um developmental disabilities administration what have you found to be the best marketing tools? The relationship that I have and developed and the respect from all the case managers. Cara, there's one on assistance. <laughs> this is funny. Um, well, it's not funny, but I mean, this was a hot topic today. So um, do you utilize OT assistance in your practice? If so, what is their role? Um, so under Medicare, Part B, occupational ther for therapists in private practice. So if you're a therapist in private practice, um, the only people under Medicare that are therapists in private practice are occupational therapists, physical therapists, and speech therapists. And at this time, OTAs and PTAs are not allowed to do Medicare Part B in the home under the therapy as private practice. Now during COVID, they lightened up those restrictions, but that's supposedly going away again, um, like October 22nd. Um, so um, yeah, Missy, you're next on the docket. Um, so this is a big, um, this is a big deal. And it's, I mean, it's a pain in the butt and it makes no sense whatsoever. Why can OTA see clients in the home um, under Medicare Part A, home health, why would they not be able to go into clients' homes um, with Medicare Part B? So that's Medicare. Um, but there are, we do have OTAs starting their own practices. We have PTAs starting their own practices, but they're hiring OTs to do, you know, the Medicare components of their programs and the evaluations and things like that. Um, but yeah, at this time, it's, it's really tough. This was one of the first mistakes I made when I started my practice because, you know, I've taught occupational therapy assistants for, for a long time. Um, and that's who I hired and started. And then I realized that they couldn't um, see my Part B clients in the home. Um, but I do have an OTA working with me right now. And she's um, going to, she's learning all the billing. Um, and she's gonna be able to see the home health part A clients I see, cause I do contract with that um, and helping me with the business aspect and some wellness type stuff. So there are ways you can utilize them. It's, it's just kind of crappy right now. Um, we had a Medicare training tonight where some dis confusion came to play um, with this OTA PTA stuff. Um, Missy, so yeah, Missy had some good questions. Um, Sue, would you consider a fall prevention part B business as a different focus than a home mods concentration? I actually think you could combine the two really well for marketing and those are the different components that you offer in your program um, because those are really key and when you look at it, Medicare combines some of those together. Um, so I think it'd be great to combine them together. 
Um, and then she also, she said, obviously similar assessments and patient education might be in place, but for marketing and niche purposes, how do you distinguish the two? I would think that I would just put them as components of here's what I offer, A, B, C, and we decide on what the patient really needs. And again, it depends on what components you're looking at offering and how you're putting those together. Um, with them. Okay, and I think there's another question on Facebook. It says, how often do you get to work with architects and construction workers? And how do you go about actually designing the home to work with other professionals? So again, it depends on what you're doing and the setup. Um, so for me, when DDA is paying for stuff, I um, would look at um, working with the builder if there's design work involved. You know, that's not covered under Medicare, so those are things you need to look at how that's going to be funded um, or looking at who's going to do that. Um, so those are pieces, again, that can be worked out individually. Uh, you can um, have an architect do some of the design. If it's simple design, um, some of the simple bathrooms and stuff, I've been doing that myself for DDA um, and working with the builder. I always bring the builder or the construction person that's doing the work. I'm in there identifying exactly where I want it to go, why it is at that level, what works for the client, and then reviewing it when it's finished. Hey, Sue, did you answer the question, is this a business that can truly stand on its own or should I keep my day job? My internet's going in and out, so I didn't know if that was answered. No, and it depends on um, your situation, why are, what, you, what your contacts are in your environment and who you're working with and how much work you're... Yeah. Yeah. And Eric, I would really just, you know, and it's something that we could jump on a phone call about and kind of discuss where you're at and what you want to do. Um, you know, because for me, I mean, I'm certified in the Parkinson's Wellness Recovery Program. So I see quite a few Parkin clients with Parkinson's disease. Um, I'm also a skills to care um, certified provider. So I work with um, clients with dementia with their caregivers um, and with all of my clients there's a home safety home modification piece that kind of comes in it but I'm definitely not one that's just all home mods versus some other people um, you know that are just home mods so I guess you really need to decide kind of what clients you want to want to work on. Um, Missy going back to your falls program um, I actually had um, an hour long meeting today with um, one of the therapists in our therapy business builder program who um, has contracts in assisted living facilities um, and has contracts with home health care assistant or home health part A companies and so forth. But she's created um, this awesome falls um, program um, that has two different tiers. One's a fall prevention tier and one is um, a post falls program um, that's designed for assisted living facilities and home care um, companies that we're going to be um, kind of presenting for therapists that you can utilize within your own business and to help market your business. So um, that program is going to be pretty awesome. That will be that will be rolling out soon. So she's done a lot of um, work and research in that and she's in a, um, teaches at a school or in academics as well. So lots of stuff you can do with that. Okay. Oh. Yes, Missy, we can definitely, um, yeah, I was just, <laughs> She just chat or message me again. It's it's a good program. I haven't even had a chance to fill Sue in. Like I said, having two OT students has taken up a lot of my time. Oh, so, um, 
Laura, if you can just stay involved in the Next Level Occupational Therapy Facebook group, um, that's a great way to be involved. Um, students get um, a huge discount to be a Next Level Visionary member, and that way you can attend all of the webinars we have um, through um, throughout the um, throughout the week. I can't speak. It's too late at night. Um, but you can come to all the webinars we have throughout the years and um, interact with everyone. Um, and again, students get that for a super low rate for our visionary membership group. So I would highly recommend joining the next level occupational therapy group. But um, for those of you who are serious about the business, definitely um, join the visionaries group as well. It's just a great support system and we've got so much positive feedback from uh, people who are in that um, program with the support that they get. Um, so if you're not ready to, you know, look at getting the um, the uh, programs and looking at actually the business, but you're looking at getting that together, absolutely there. There's a lot of support in um, a lot of places where we vet information and you can get um, access to webinars consistently that are helpful. Awesome. Well, um, we will be sending out the recording so you guys have the recording, the links, um, and just a reminder um, for those of you guys that were on that sign up for our program before the 9th, um, you'll get a $200 off. Also, um, set up um, we are going to be opening up some spots for those that have questions on what I should do, if I should do it, um, because again, we want to make sure this is right for you and the right time and to make sure which program would be the best fit for you. So um, feel free to reach us out. Reach. I, re I really need to go to bed. Reach out to us. <laughs> reach out to us. Good Lord. So you guys have a wonderful night um, and thanks for being on. We appreciate it. So thank you all. Good night. Don't, uh, yeah, please pull out. hang on this one question. Okay. All right. You guys are welcome. Thanks. Mm -hmm.